So I'm going to start recording. So whoever wants to listen later can. All right. So welcome everyone back to the Learn at Link series. And we're back here with Alfred Hall for part two uh, for the how gardening can support the eight dimensions, um, using eight dimensions of wellness. Um, so again, Alfred Hall is the executive director or retired executive director of HUGS. And so I guess we can start now. So if you want, Alfred, you can take it away. Sure, thank you very much for those attending and those who may watch later. Our last time around, we talked about the um, Mental Health Association's eight dimensions of wellness and how a garden supports them. Um, we discussed how it affects the wellness of individuals, of communities, and of the environment. Today, what I want to do is talk about some gardening tips. Um, I'll start by saying I've killed a lot of plants because I have. Um, and what I've done over time is learn a lot of valuable lessons that I've been able to apply in what I do for gardening. Um, they're not original ideas. Uh, when I want to uh, learn about planting something I've never planted before, or I see something that looks like a disease I've never seen before, or um, pests that I really don't know what they are, um, I go to the internet. Um, because the internet has so much information on it that, that uh, I, why should I recreate I was a consultant in a previous life. We learned to beg, borrow, or steal. Uh, there's um, some original thought, but um, most most things about gardening have been pretty well documented over time, so I use the internet. So the first thing I'm gonna discuss is I do have a Facebook page that I started after I retired from Hubs. I've been at it now about a month, four to six weeks. And what I do on my Facebook page is just put different tips that I have learned over the years. So for instance, um, this is a partial list of some of the tips you can find on the Facebook page. It's everything from um, buying seed, to ordering seed, to starting seed, to caring for seedlings, to how to plant, to how to maintain, to how to harvest, and how to preserve and use um, garden vegetables, herbs, and flowers. So these are just a few of the different um, helpful hints. They're all small. They all have links to uh, other sites where you can find additional information, but it's from everything from drying herbs in a, a a food dehydrator to um, taking care of birds in the winter, to starting a pollinator garden, um, to uh, the steps you need to be taking this time of the year to close your garden down successfully for the year, uh, composting in the ground. I, there's just so many, I, I forget. I, I usually do them a, a week in advance and schedule them so I don't have to worry or think about what I'm going to do today. That's usually my Sunday activity. So you might find those links useful um, to uh, help you in, in your particular um, gardening endeavor, be it one small container that you're growing a tomato in, or in the case when I was with Hugs, um, we had about 50 boxes and about a half an acre of uh, row and hoe gardening we did. So um, the principles apply whether it's a single container or a community garden. So uh, that might be information that you're interested in seeing and looking at. Um, there's some general points to remember about gardening. Um, it's not just putting seeds in the ground and watching them grow. That's just not the way it works. Um, the first thing you should always do is plan your garden. 
what you're going to plant, how many you're going to plant, where you're going to plant it, and most importantly, how much time do you have to tend the garden? Um, I recommend that you plant what you eat um, because if you're not going to eat it or give it away, um, there's really not a lot of sense in planting it unless you're trying to plant to attract pollinators or beneficial uh, insects uh, to your garden. And I highly recommend you start small and you start with easy stuff because um, some things are hard to grow, some things are not as hard to grow. And most people like tomatoes, peppers, and greens. So those are three, pro uh, three uh, vegetables that you can grow very easily that uh, will grow in a container or grow in a row and a hoe garden. It does take time and effort. Don't plant a half an acre if all you have to take time to take care of is a container um, because it, it'll just get overgrown and uh, it'll become more of a nuisance than it is a benefit to you. Uh, like I said, I've killed a lot of plants. You will have disappointments. Um, gardening, um, it, it's an amazing thing. I've been doing uh, community gardens here in Hamilton since 2009. I always had a little garden at home, but I never really um, did much large scale gardening. Um, I actually got started because the mayor of Hamilton, Pat Moeller, asked me to. And I said, give me water. If you give me water and you give me a place, then I'll give it a shot. Um, but what I found was um, having a couple tomato plants in the backyard is different than a community garden. And um, I had to learn the proper way to garden, what to grow, where to grow it, how to grow it. And in many cases, I wasn't successful at first, but um, over time, um, I learned through my mistakes and um, I found that uh, certain things um, work better than others, but, and if it was up to me, by the way, I would grow cucumbers, scallions, lettuce, tomatoes, sweet peppers, hot peppers, just basic salads, radishes, carrots, basic salad stuff. But um, Patty, who my wife, who uh, started Hugs with, with me back in 2011, I uh, always wanted to try something new, and it never ceased to amaze me that 90% um, of the time we, success, we were successful and the 10% of the time that we weren't, uh, we learned and ended up being successful growing just about anything we wanted to grow. Um, I think the other thing that amazes me is every year, every year since 2008, nine when I started I start my seeds in a little greenhouse attached to Butler County Metro Housing Authority's apartment building on North 6th Street in Hamilton and every year I wonder whether or not the seeds are going to come up are they going to become seedlings am I going to be successful and lo and behold every year they do but every year I have that nagging suspicion that oh my goodness they're not coming up they're not coming up but they usually do 90 95 percent of the time and when they don't what i usually find out is i didn't plant the seeds um pretty instructions some things you put in at different depths than others some you just scatter on top and just put a little teeny layer of soil on um some of the times i didn't read the back of the packet so i'd plant them wrong and, and they wouldn't come up but every time i i paid attention to what i was supposed to be doing and planted the seeds properly they did come up and um my germination rates always good um and i've learned over the years that um today's disappointment Probably, if you go back and look at what you did, is something that you did. Um, 
that you can correct. Now, obviously the amount of sun and, and the water and rain and the temperature of where you're growing um, things is going to affect um, how bountiful your harvest is, pests, disease, all those things. But if you look at it, pay attention to it, you will be successful, but you will have disappointments. So that's the way, that's the way it goes. And one of the things that I also learned over time is <sighs> scissors are sharp. I'm not allowed to use sharp objects and power tools can cut you. And um, you have to be safe in the garden. It's not a place where you go and flip flops to garden, um, at least not in a garden of any size. So safety is extremely important in the garden. Also, uh, getting yourself overheated, dehydration is also a problem in the garden. I, I sometimes in the past go out at daybreak, and that can be anywhere from five o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the morning. And usually spend um, most of the day in the garden. And what I learned over time was I'd come home and at night I'd be in bed and all of a sudden every muscle in my body would tighten up because I didn't stay hydrated. I would come home and I would be overly tired and uh, close to sunstroke, never got sunstroke. But um, I found that resting in the shade made sense, that drinking plenty of water made sense, that being safe in the garden made sense. And I found that I would be in the garden the same amount of time, get the same amount of work done, but I could have rest stops and I had to drink my water and I had to, I had to stay safe in the garden. So, that is that is very important from your own physical well-being as it is for you taking care of your garden um there's all kinds of gardens you can do um crop rotation is important and what i have here is a excel spreadsheet that i put together for somebody who asked me gee i got a 20 by 24 space that i want to do a garden on can you send me a design so what I did was, uh, I like using Excel. There are some very good um, um, applications that you can get that will design your garden for you. Um, Seed Savers Exchange has a very good one with all kinds of symbols from not only vegetables, but whether it's square foot gardening or, or row and hoe gardening, and whether you want a fence or a building, it'll just lay it all out for you. I tend to go to Excel when I do do my uh, gardens because I'm very comfortable with with Excel. But this is a 20 by 24 space, not very big. But as you can see, I have um, 10 tomatoes. Uh, the dotted lines with the triangle show that I'm trellising those tomatoes. And uh, it gives you the space in between each tomato and the space in between the rows in each tomato. Uh, tomatoes um, get fairly large. Um, they're actually not perennials. I think I read somewhere the tallest tomato plant ever grown was close to 100 feet tall. Uh, they're really not perennials. We, we grow them as perennials. Uh, uh, they're not really not annuals. We grow them as annuals, but they really can grow uh, year to year if you're in the right climate. And they need lots of room for the airflow to get between them, which helps cut down on disease and pests. So these happen to be three feet apart and the row happened to be four feet apart. I've shown the trellis on them and tomatoes. Right in front of the tomatoes, I have beans. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, again, in a 20 by 24 area, I have tomatoes and then my beans, as you can see, I have 38 bush bean plants. Um, I love beans, but I don't love harvesting them. And I found bush beans are easier than pole beans. But again, uh, this particular diagram I put together for someone says, uh, showed them how many to plant, when to plant them, 
how far apart to plant them within the rows, how far to plant them between the rows. And then my last um, two rows to the bottom of that slide is actually sweet corn. And again, I show um, how many you can plant, how far apart, how far the rows need to be. And what I would tell this person to do is um, most crop rotation plans should have a four year plan. I should have uh, another family of plant vegetables underneath. But what I would do next year is I would move the corn to where the tomatoes are, which isn't the best in the world because they're both high nitrogen users in the soil. I'd move the tomatoes to where the beans are because beans put nitrogen into the soil, tomatoes take them out. And then I would put the beans where the corn was to replenish the nitrogen that the corn took out. And I would just rotate those uh, year to year. And the reason I do that is to, if you plant the same plant in the same place all the time, then you're depleting the nutrients in the soil and you're telling the hornworms that are gonna attack your tomatoes, go to this coordinate every year because this idiot plants his tomato in the same place and he's gonna let you eat it all up. So it helps with pests and it helps with uh, controlling the, the nutrients in the soil naturally without um, chemicals. So that's just a little design of a typical 20 by 24 row and hoe garden. If you happen to have a 10 by 12, uh, you could very easily cut this in half and see what you would grow in a 10 by 12. So, or if you wanted to expand it, you could do that. But this is an example of how I would plan my garden before I plant. All right, uh, if you're gonna grow stuff, you gotta have seeds of plants. If you don't have seeds of plants, all you're gonna grow is uh, grass, crabgrass, and other wild um, plants. Now that's not always a bad thing. Uh, this year in the garden, um, I had a couple community gardeners that were uh, foragers, and they came in the garden and said, hey, look what you got growing there, you can eat that. And I said, what, that's a weed. And they said, no, 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 you can eat that. And half of this one person's garden in uh, the community garden, all she did was cultivate around the, what I considered weeds, but were really forageable food. And she just let it grow. And then she grew other stuff in the other part of her garden. Um, but you got to have seeds or plants. If you're going to grow tomatoes and you don't have tomatoes, seeds or plants, you're not going to grow tomatoes, although they will come back every year. Um, at least you get volunteers on occasion. You got to have sun and you got to have water. Uh, plants need sun and water. They need soil. They need healthy soil. And between the soil, the sun, and the water, um, you're going to be able to grow just about anything as long as your season is long enough for it to reach maturity. Um, I always suggest that if you're gonna grow in the ground, especially in an urban area like I do, that um, you test the soil. Um, a lot of the uh, empty lots here in town had um, buildings on them, um, factories on them and other things. And not only do you have a bunch of rubble three or four or five inches down, uh, you also wanna make sure there's no heavy metal or anything in the ground that could hurt, that could hurt them, that could be picked up by the roots of the plant and enter your body and not be healthy for you. Being a guy, or at least it's been my observation. Um, we don't follow directions well. We don't even read directions. But if you're going to have a garden, your seed packet or your plant marker is your friend. You need to read and follow the directions on how to plant a garden. If you're gonna do row and hoe, you're gonna need some tools, equipment, and it is work. And um, I don't mind the work because I'm doing something I love to do. Um, 
there had been a couple of years where I did mind to work because I didn't follow my own advice, which is scale my garden to the amount of time that I had or volunteers I had to work it. So it became very frustrating because I knew I should be um, thinning my carrots, but I didn't have time to thin my carrots because I had to mow the grass. So um, you have to be um, very careful that um, it doesn't become a nuisance instead of a benefit. And you have to realize that that means that you are going to have to sweat a little bit, especially if you do a row and hoe. Raised boxes, containers are a little easier, but um, you still have to put effort into your garden. Again, it's not just dropping seeds in the ground and walking away and they're gonna grow and you're gonna get a bountiful harvest or as bountiful a harvest as you could. Uh, you need to weed and you need to always be on the lookout for disease and pests. You need to hoe and you need to water and you need to harvest. And if you're going to do, um, I do a lot of um, succession planting. Um, even in my boxes, I'll take four boxes, which are um, normally three by six, 18 square feet. I can put four leaf lettuce in a square. So four times 18, 72, 72 or whatever the math is, leaf lettuce in one box. So knowing that lettuce takes 28 days to mature, what I do is I plant a box, a week later I plant another box, a week later I plant another box, a week later I plant another box. By the time I plant that fourth box, I can go back to the first box and cut it. I could pull the plants out, but I found it can get at least two harvest out of lettuce before it starts to really try to bolt on you, go to seed and become bitter and cut that lettuce off. And I've got lettuce out of the first box. The next week I do box two. The next week I do box three. Next week I do box four. So I have lettuce four weeks in a row. And what I do is I then go back to the first box, pull the lettuce, harvest it, and replant. Next week, box two, next week, box three, the next week, box four, and start to cycle all over again. <coughs> so, excuse me, I grow lettuce all year long uh, from March, April uh, through November, sometimes earlier or later based on the weather or based on whether or not I cover it. And I have lettuce all year long, succession planting. But again, since I'm doing succession planting, that takes extra effort and time. And I have to make sure I have time to do that. Uh, weeding, there's weeds are relentless. Um, mildew, fungus, vine borers, cucumber beetles, all those things are relentless in a garden and you have to be on the lookout for them. And um, I happen to use organic methods to try to control all those things. And um, I probably have a few tips on how to control all those things on my uh, Facebook page, uh, gardening tip Facebook page. But uh, I use a mixture of Murphy oil soap garlic and hot peppers to keep bugs away. Um, I use um, baking soda to help um, with certain types of mildew. Uh, so there's different things I do um, to try to uh, control disease and pests. So that's um, the start of it all. I do organic, uh, I grow organic, and I buy organic seeds and plants. You can either grow your own if you have a place that's sunny enough and warm enough in the winter, you can start your own plants, or you can go out and purchase them. Uh, we have several um, very good vendors from, uh, in my area, Hamilton TNT Greenhouses out on Jacksonburg Road, um, um, Couches Market and Greenhouse, uh, out of New Miami, 
Al uh, Joe's on the west side of Hamilton um, are usually in the places I buy local. Um, I also buy um, a lot of my seeds from um, high mowing organic um, seed company. They're out of Vermont. They were the first uh, certified um, organic um, seed grower in the country, the organic pledge, they're the first ones that took that. And I've had really good luck with germination and really good luck, uh, luck with the varieties I was looking for. Also, um, Seed Savers Exchange, um, and there's a few others that you can buy seeds from um, organically. Uh, be patient. Um, if you plant, if you plant seeds to start seedlings, and it says it's going to take seven to ten days to germinate, don't expect them to pop up in four. Uh, so what I tend to do when I grow seeds or seedlings or, or plants in the ground is I'll take a little um, water-resistant marker, and I'll put the date, I'll put them in. Uh, and the date that they're due to either germinate and or to harvest. So I can sort of keep my eye open, not get overly impatient. And by the way, plan my time. I know that come around this time based on the weather and, and uh, the environment that I'm going to be, that I'm going to see tomato plants with tomatoes on them. That I'm going to have carrots that are ready to pull out of the ground. Um, that kind of thing, but you have to be patient. They're not, you can't speed up the process too much outside. You can speed it up somewhat if you're growing inside hydroponically with uh, nutrient water or aquaponically if you're using fish and, uh, and um, the ammonia from the fish poop to turn into the nit nitrites and nitrates that plants uh, need to grow. But, Outside, they're going to grow basically uh, based on the maturity date on the seed packet. And if you do happen to uh, buy seeds and or save seeds, when you store them, you do not want to store them in the direct sunlight, and you do not want to let them get too hot or overheated. Um, on more than one occasion, I've taken seeds that I've started to plant and thrown them in glove box of my car and although it's dark in there in the sun my car gets to be 125 degrees so i'm baking the seeds and baked seeds don't grow that well um, so store any seeds that you have once you've purchased them or harvest them out of direct sun and out of uh, too hot an area i find a closet works very well you can put them in the vegetator you can even freeze them um, they'll, they'll still grow and their life, their usable life will be longer. Sun, um, six to eight hours a day. Um, some plants will not grow well in heat and direct sun. So obviously, if you're going to grow something like a spinach, lettuce, radish, you're going to grow them early in the season when it's cooler. And you, you can use shade cloth. Um, to uh, protect your plants from the sun, sunlight and the heat to some degree. You just want to make sure it's open on both sides so the airflow can get through and that it's UV protected. That uh, just throwing um, any old thing on it to shade it uh, works, but um, if you're going to be out in the direct sun and use a shade cloth like you see in this picture, you want to know, is it going to let 20% of the sun in, 80% of the sun in? What's going to be the UV protection? Uh, this last year, I tried something really different. Uh, I was growing in a, a hoop house, a 30 by 72 hoop house. And I started uh, my tomatoes and my sweet peppers inside the hoop house. And I had access to large sheets of cardboard and the way I trellised my tomatoes was I used a T-post, a metal T-post and hung a, a con, uh, I, um, metal con 
concrete reinforcement for the tomatoes to travel up. Well, what I did was I bent that those cardboards at a 90 degree angle and shoved them down over the T-post and it gave my plant shade during the really hot time in the hoop house. So it worked pretty well. I've been known to use shade cloth a lot. And like I say, if you spinach and radishes, if you don't put them in the shade out of the heat are very hard to grow in the summer. Lettuce you can, to some degree, I grow leaf lettuce, but again, like I tell you, I, I constantly am changing it out, changing it out so that uh, it can't bolt on me. Water, rainwater is good. Um, it's actually the best. Um, if you think about it, at least this is the way I was taught, um, rain forms a lot around a little pieces of uh, solid material, dirt, dust in the wind. Be a nice name for a song, dust in the wind. But um, what happens is that moisture forms around those dust, soil particles, or whatever other particles are in the air. And eventually, um, they get heavy enough that they fall back to earth. But a lot of times during that process of falling back to the earth, they get electrically charged from lightning. And uh, electrically charged particles of dirt with moisture around them fall onto your garden. That is good for your garden. If you can't collect rainwater and you're going to use treated water, let it sit for about 24 hours. Most of the chemicals will come out within 24 to 48 hours. Um, try to use water saving techniques that can be drip irrigation. Um, that can be um, a rainwater. It can be many different things, but um, I try to keep the water off my plants. I try to water at the roots. I try to use uh, as least water as I can, uh, that'll keep the plants healthy, and I try to water consistently. All those things help your plants um, grow better and um, will help you avoid some disease like end rot, tomatoes, um, peppers especially. Uh, I have a schedule. I water my tomatoes every three to four days, sometimes five days. According to what the long range forecast looks like at the beginning of the year, I set my watering schedule for tomatoes and I stick to it. I don't water a day, skip five days, water two days in a row, skip eight days, I water at a consistent schedule. So water consistently and keep your soil moist one to two inches below the soil line. Um, if you're using a raised box and, and um, you're using a mixture um, of, I use vermiculite, coarse vermiculite, peat moss, and um, manure. Manures, the manures for um, the nutrients, the peat mosses to retain moisture, and the vermiculites to uh, give aeration to the soil. It, it sort of acts like a sponge. Once the, that mixture is saturated, you can't put more into it, it'll run off. But if you're planting in the ground, what happens is, is once the soil becomes saturated with water, it starts to puddle on the top. And what you're actually doing is your roots are sitting in a puddle of water and they will die. So um, water consistently, don't water too much, keep the soil one to two inches moist. Just, I use my finger. <laughs> And I stick it into the soil, and if and if it's moist, it's moist. And it, you can tell too what a soil if you grab a bunch of soil and and you clump it in your hand, and it sort of breaks apart. It's probably okay moisture wise. If it comes out of your hand like dust, it's too dry. If it if it gets into a big ball and clump and doesn't break apart easily, then it's probably got too much water. 
So there's easy ways to sort of uh, figure, or you can get a rain gauge <laughs> and put it in the soil and it'll tell you. So water is extremely important as is sunshine. Healthy soil. Most things you grow, um, normal vegetables, herbs, uh, edible flowers have a pH requirement of 6.5 to 7.0. Now there's some that grow in less pH and some that grow in uh, more pH. However, um, that's a general range and you can do an easy at-home soil test to figure out what your pH is. I give you a picture down there. And I think it probably has a link on it. Um, so pH is important. That helps your, your plant roots take up the nutrients they need in order to be healthy and to be as bountiful as they can be. Um, the way that you adjust pH is, uh, one of the ways you can adjust pH is uh, sulfur. Uh, if you wanna raise it and, excuse me, you want to use lime if you want to raise it and sulfur if you want to lower the pH. And I forget the exact poundage per square foot, but if you look it up online, you can you can find out how to lower or raise your pH um, of your soil. Organic matter is extremely important to your soil. Um, I do compost, uh, leaves, grass clippings, um, and um, organic vegetable scraps. I don't use meat, um, citrus uh, fruits and some other things, but I do compost um, and it does work and it's very healthy for your soil. Worms are extremely important. When I first started uh, my first garden here in Hamilton out by Miami University, Hamilton, there were no worms in the soil. Uh, I did check it for uh, things like lead, um, asbestos, other heavy metals, things that would have kept me from growing in the ground because it wouldn't, I wouldn't have felt it was healthy. And the soil was clean, but there really was very few or no worms. Um, there was very few or no anything. It was basically a dump before and it was a dead space. But over time, by adding organic material, practicing organic methods, uh, plowing stuff into the ground um, when the season was over, uh, worms came back. Uh, my rule of thumb is I know ground is healthy again the first time I see a praying mantis. And um, eventually, if the if, this, if you're planting, you're planting organically and you're not killing off the uh, indigenous plants and um, insects and um, birds and other things in your environment, your uh, soil will um, improve over time, unless it has something like asbestos or radioactive material or lead in it. Um, and obviously, like I said, you should compost. Uh, this year, I've actually tried something different. Um, I have um, 14 three by six boxes that I put a fall garden in at a local mission that serves food every day. And I've had them saving my, their kitchen scraps, a little bit of coffee grounds, a few eggshells, which I, which I sort of make much smaller by blending them into just about a dust and um, vegetable matter. I actually took my box, which is uh, boxes, which are 12 inches deep. And um, I dug the dirt out. I put um, unwaxed cardboard in the bottom. And then I put about oh, two to three inches of organic waste from the kitchen in the bottom of the box. And then I put fill the rest of the box up with soil. And by next spring, that rod of material will break down. I'll mix that in with the rest of the soil and I've actually added um, organic matter to my soil 
and let the soil do the work. Um, I also tried one box with just um, brown matter, which was shredded uh, cardboard, shredded newspaper, and grass clippings and covered that with soil. I'm just trying to see how each one of those might react or or affect the, uh, the health of the soil. So there's all kinds of things you can do. Like I said, follow the directions on the seed pack when planting. It's going to tell you how deep to plant the seed, what your plant's going to be from a size and a height and a breadth of maturity, uh, what kind of watering requirements has, how many days of germination, what should my plant spacing be between my rows, uh, how much sun will it tolerate, how much space should I have between my rows of plants, and uh, days to maturity. Looks like I got days of maturity twice, so it must have been important to me. Uh, these are key to growing healthy, productive plants and can be found on the seed packet and the marker. And this is just an example, a numbered example uh, that shows this, uh, this happens to be Brussels sprouts, and then it gives you a little uh, description of what Brussels sprouts are. Then it talks about where you should plant it. If you start it indoors, how soon you should plant it, how deep you should plant it, what the seed spacing should be, um, on and on and on. So, and then it goes into um, a little more detail on when and where to plant it, how to care for it, how you harvest it, et cetera. Sometimes instead of words, they use pictures. And um, I've also included those where it shows full sun. Um, and if it's partial sun, it'll show a half a sun. <coughs> Excuse me. They all show also sometimes and visually will tell you in centimeters <coughs> and or in inches how deep to plant your seed, what your um, uh, spacing should be so you know what and how to thin your plants. Etc. So this is just some um, different things that you can find in different formats on a seed packet um, that'll help you in your uh, planting of your garden. Row and hoe gardening. Uh, I came back to Ohio in 2008. Uh, I lived out on Pleasant Plain. On a, my brother has a farm out while building with a big open space acres so i said hey brother i'm coming home i'd like to live in your place which i knew was empty out in the country and and um, do some gardening some larger scale gardening i'd spent a year up in uh, fitzwilliams new hampshire which is where i spent my adult life in new england um, learning how to organic farm and i figured i'd come home i'd spend a couple years reconnect with family and then go to u.s virgin islands and grow food there, but spend most of my time sitting on the beach. But what I found out very quickly with row and hoe garden is you do have to have the right tools and equipment, and that's a lot of work. A hoeing, plowing, tilling, weeding, and 95 degrees weather in the full sun is work. Um, so, um, Expect it. Know that it's going to be there, and um, plan your what you grow and how much you grow based on how much uh, you want to spend uh, on tools and equipment, and or how much work, sweat you want to uh, create doing your garden. Obviously, contain you can you can grow many different ways. I grow in I grow in uh, an urban setting. I've used pallets. I've used straw bales. I've used raised boxes. I've used containers. Uh, all those things, once you've got them set up and going, uh, requires less time, less resources, and less physical labor. Uh, but with that said, um, especially in the straw bale pallet and raised gardening techniques of gardening, you think in squares versus a long row of plants, 
and you can grow as much in a 20 square foot raised box as you can grow in a hundred square feet of row and hoe gardening. So less space, uh, less weeding, less watering, less time in the 95 degree sun. So they are very good ways to, uh, to grow uh, in an urban setting. Um, there are ways that you can do row and hoe gardening that will also save time, resources, and labor. Uh, one of the ways that I garden sometimes, I uh, haven't done it the last few years, is what's called a three sisters, where in a 10 by 10 area, I put nine mounds that are basically a foot and um, high and a foot round, and I plant um, four or five uh, corn kernels in the top of the mound. And uh, after the corn gets about, oh, six inches, well, it's probably a little small, a foot high, I plant pole beans around each of those stalks of corn. And in between the mounds, I plant a vining crop like watermelon, winter squash, acorn squash. And in that 10 by 10 area, I can get nine mounds of corn, four to five per mound, which is 36 to 45 stalks of corn. Each stalk of corn has three to four uh, corn on it. So four times, whatever, uh, I plant three or four pole beans around each corn stalk, which uses the corn stalk as a trellis. So the corn is taking the nitrogen out of the air. The beans are putting the nitrogen back in and have a place to grow up. So if you take five corn, uh, three pole beans around each one, three times five, five is 15 times nine mounds, and that's how many pole bean plants I have. And then in between each mound, I've got um, two, four, six, seven, eight, eight, eight vining plants. And the vining plants uh, cover the ground, which keeps the weeds down, but it also provides shade, which keeps the moisture from evaporating as quickly from the ground. And if you've ever seen a rabbit, um, uh, a raccoon or whatever, when they eat from a garden, they stand up on their back legs and their heads are constantly sw swiveling. That's because they don't wanna become somebody's lunch. And they don't like those big vining plants with the big, big leaves because when they sit up, they can't see over the leaves. So it helps deter them. They'll go to the garden next door that doesn't have that, right? And leave yours alone. So there are ways of planting the ground that will save you time, energy, and level and take up less space. And if you happen to like pumpkins, uh, green beans, and corn, you're set to go. Um, technique taught by the Indians to the pioneers who would have starved if they hadn't been taught it. And yes, they did throw fish heads in the hole. Fish heads are good fertilizer. They didn't go down to uh, Al Joe's and buy a, a sack of organic fertilizer. Al Joe's wasn't around. So um, there are ways to, to do row and hoe gardening that will save time, resources, and effort. When you plant, uh, soil temperature is extremely important. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but different plants germinate and grow better when the soil is cooler than hotter. Some plants grow better when the soil is hotter than cooler. And this is just a table that'll that'll give you some of the uh, common things that you can grow, um, when you should start them indoors, uh, when to start outdoors, uh, what the temperature should be, how long it's gonna take to mature, et cetera. So it's a useful chart. And again, you can find all this stuff online. I'm gonna to have to excuse myself for 30 seconds. Somebody's knocking on my door. I'll be right back.
sorry about that. All right, plant and row spacing. I just gave you some common vegetables. Um, I trellis everything. I try to save as much space as I can. Um, it also, if you trellis up, it tends to um, allow airflow better, and it also allows, um, uh, it helps minimize or can help minimize some disease and some uh, fungus that you would get. So cucumbers, peppers, and tomatoes are what I use as an example. And then within the row, um, cucumbers are two to three inches apart, uh, between rows 18 to 24. Um, peppers, uh, 14 to 18 apart, and um, between rows 18 to 24. And tomatoes, um, which get very, have a large breadth and height and need more space, 24 to 36 inches apart, and three to four feet uh, between the rows. Um, you may find slightly different numbers within a row and between a row according to where you go to, but I never plant my tomatoes within a row um, closer than three feet. And I never plant my tomatoes between rows less than four feet. Um, it just helps. I found that it helps me keep my um, fungus and mildew problems down to a, a minimum by giving them plenty of room to uh, uh, have airflow. And as the plants mature and get larger, the smaller space you have between plants within a row, or the smaller space you have between rows, um, what I found out the first two or three years, I said, it, it might have said, uh, use 18 inches. So I said, ah, I'll use six. Pretty soon I couldn't get in a daggone row. <laughs> I mean, tomatoes will grow. I mean, they grow and pretty soon that three foot row that you had becomes a two foot row. So, and then it becomes a one foot row. So um, spacing is extremely important. And then I've just given you some examples of um, different ways to stake or, or trellis uh, tomatoes, peppers, uh, looks like cucumbers on the left hand side um, and again you can find all this information on the web i gave you a, an example companion planting i do a lot of companion planting three sisters is a companion garden i'm planting corn beans and vining squash or pumpkin in the same space um, companion planting um, does several things for you. There's a little book called Carrots Love Tomatoes because carrots do love tomatoes and tomatoes do love carrots. You can grow them together. Carrots, the main portion of the fruit that you eat is a root that grows down. Tomatoes, the opposite, it grows up. Um, so, it's a good use of space. It also helps improve the flavor. The tomatoes also give carrots some shade, and carrots like a little bit of shade. Nasturtium. Nasturtium is a flower uh, that really grows extremely well and covers the ground and keeps weeds down. And the flowers are edible. I remember the first time I ever saw a nasturtium on my salad. I sort of pushed it to the side because I wasn't quite sure why it was there. Um, it has a peppery, spicy taste, but cucumbers and nasturtium go very well together. The cucumbers, I trellis them, that's the middle picture. I happen to be growing in a heat treated wooden pallet. I, I don't use uh, chemically treated wood. <coughs> and some pallets are, are treated chemically. You can tell whether they're treated chemically or heat treated to preserve them by looking at the blocks on the end of the pallet. There will be stamped with where they were made and how they were treated. And a big HT means they were heat treated. And I'll use those. Um, you can turn the pallet over so you're only using the big four holes on the bottom or keep it right side up and plant between the slits. Don't try to grow a potato on the slit side 
of the power because you won't be able to harvest it. Um, one year I, I figured I'd grow some carrots in a pallet and I put them all, put the carrot seeds between the pallet slats. But when I went to pull the carrot out, the carrot was bigger than the, than the hole between the slats. So I ended up having to unwrap the fabric cloth around it to get my carrots. But nasturtium and, and cucumbers grow well together. Nasturtium helps repel cucumber beetles, supplies shade to the ground and keeps weeds down for the cucumbers and helps keep the moisture in the soil. So that's a, 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 a example of companion planting. I've already talked about three sisters. There are plants you should not plant together. And if you wanna find out about companion planting, uh, that's a very good link that I've put on there for you to go to. Whoops. Trellis. Um, again, like I say, I try to grow up. I try to use as least space as I can. Got a chain link fence that'll work as a trellis. Um, or you can make your own trellis or you can buy a trellis. Um, this happens to be um, uh, some trellising that um, Patty and I did in the garden we had over by Miami University Hamilton years ago. And really all it is, is, is um, I, I made my boxes four foot by four foot, 16 square feet, uh, which will allow me to grow really 16 sweet peppers if I wanted, uh, four to five tomatoes if I wanted. So I need if I need trellising, all I did was uh, you can go to a, a big box store and you can um, buy a 10 foot, 10 foot piece of rebar, half inch rebar, and cut it in half, uh, cut it in uh, two foot lengths or buy it pre-cut if you want. Um, or you can use half inch conduit pipe, metal conduit pipe you can buy at uh, one of the big box stores. Cut, they're 10 feet long, they cost less than $3. Cut them in two foot pieces. Um, then at the outside corners, picture one of each uh, box, we drove that half inch conduit pipe into the ground one foot and left a foot sticking up and uh, from the ground. When we drove it in the ground, another lesson learned was use a block of wood when you pound the top of the half inch conduit pipe or you're going to flatten that conduit pipe out, flare it out. Because what we then then did after we drove the two pieces of um, conduit pipe a foot into the ground at the outside edges of the back of the box to the north side, because higher plants should always go to the north side so they don't shade your other plants. After we drove that into the ground, we took three inch, excuse me, three quarter inch PVC pipe, which again, you can uh, buy in 10 foot lengths. And we cut it at six feet, which gave me a six foot piece and a four foot piece. And I did that twice. I took the six, in, the six feet, six foot pieces of three quarter PVC pipe and I slid one each down over that half inch conduit, fits perfectly. So now I had two legs of a frame at each end of the box. I took that four, remember I said PVC pipes 10 feet, I cut it at six feet, I had a four foot piece left over. Since my box was four foot long, I now took that four foot piece and in um, photo number two using 90 degree three quarter inch PVC elbows that I put on the top of each of the legs of the frame. I put the four piece in the four foot piece in between it. Now I had a frame at the back of my box on the north side that was six, well, not quite six feet from the ground because the, the box was uh, six inches high. So I had, so I had six inches of 10, a half inch conduit pipe that was down in the box, excuse me, above the box, six inches equal to the box and then a foot under the box. So a foot under the ground, a foot above the ground. Slid the three quarter PVC over, 
attach the four foot um, half inch, a uh, three quarter inch PVC pipe on the top. Then what I did was you can buy this um, a barrier, a fence barrier, plastic fence barrier, you buy it orange or green. You've seen it at construction sites. I buy green because it looks a little prettier. It happens to be four foot wide. My box is four foot wide. My frame is four foot apart. So now I can just drop that uh, netting, that plastic netting, over the frame, cut it at the bottom, zip tie it together with zip ties, and voila, I got a trellis, six foot tall, at the back of my box that I can grow cucumbers, that I can grow tomatoes, anything that I need to trellis. And to give you an example of how effective that can be, uh, this picture right here is four boxes. They're slightly bigger than four foot by four foot because um, I actually used um, siding for the box material. But as you can see, these are, see they were, I want to say about four foot by eight foot long with a trellis like you see here in the back. And look at all the tomatoes and cucumbers that I have growing and how much little space they take. So it literally in front of those uh, tomatoes, I had um, two feet before I got to where I stopped in front of the tomato times six or eight feet long that I could plant lettuce or scallions or carrots or sweet peppers or eggplant or whatever. And a very useful and very efficient use of space by trellising my plants instead of letting them lay on the ground. And again, as I said, it helps with pests and uh, disease if you keep them off the ground. Helps. Again, the seed packet is extremely important. Read it, follow it. If you do, you will have a much better chance of success when you garden. Tending, well, now you got her all planted, you got to tend it. Again, weed, controlling disease and pests, hoeing, watering, harvesting, and replanting. If uh, you either succession plant or if you have something that uh, our, our, um, Growing season here in Southwest Ohio is basically between May 15th, if you have to worry about frost, to October 15th. Although it seems to, first frost seems to be getting later every year, but um, we basically have a six month growing season for most crops. Some things you can plant earlier, but if you're planting something like radish in the spring that only takes 28 days to mature, that space is gonna become available. So you could replant it with something else. So that's what I mean by replanting or succession planting as I already discussed. The best weeding tool I have found is the shuffle hoe. They just work extremely well, get into tight spaces and you're less likely to um, chop down the plant you're trying to save from the weeds. Um, hoeing, uh, as, as I said, you need row space. You can't get in there to a hoe if you don't have uh, enough space to uh, get yourself in and that when you hoe, you can sort of side dress, bring up the soil, loosen the soil around your plants, which will help the moisture get in better. Um, this particular plant uh, looks like it has powdery mildew and that's what i talk uh, when i talk about you watch your plants you will see the insects you will see the disease usually look at the top of the leaf the bottom of the leaf the stalks in the ground when you're looking for insects vine borers and squash bugs never saw them anywhere as bad as i have in southwest ohio but be on the lookout for uh, disease and um, um, pests. Also, 
you should be on the, you'll get in the habit of looking at your garden and you really won't notice when everything is okay. Something out of the ordinary is going to pop up at you. Why is that leaf all white? Or what are those little golden eggs? That, what is that bug? And you'll notice that. Um, when it's fine, you don't even really notice it uh, after a while. But keep an eye out for those kinds of things. And there are ways to naturally control um, um, weeds as well as um, pests. Uh, you can use a natural herbicide, a natural pesticide, the same way you can use um, uh, composted material instead of um, chemical fertilizer, even if it's organic and save yourself some money. And also, um, instead of bagging the leaves up and throwing them in a, a bag and having a garbage take them off, you can use them in a compost pile or in your garden. So that's a good thing. Uh, watering, again, uh, saving water is good. Drip irrigation is not really that difficult to put in. It's not that expensive either if... Um, I, I use 250-gallon tote boxes. Those are those wide, those are those plastic big uh, tanks you see in wire uh, frames at construction sites. They use those for water. Well, I use those, bring it up uh, a couple cinder blocks high or a couple two or three pallets high, attach a drip hose to that and let the gravity, since the tote box is higher than the garden, feed my drip line and I have no um, moving mechanical parts to uh, work with. I just open the valve up, let it run two or three hours or whatever until the soil's most, shut the valve. You can even go one step further than that by putting a float valve in a, a container that will, um, as, a water, as the water is used, uh, the float valve goes down and opens the water up so it so you get the right level of water and as uh, once it fills to a certain degree the float valve goes up and shuts the water off i didn't even have to turn the lever off anymore i used the float valve to control it for me non-mechanical part i have no clue what that la i can't even make out this what is it oh this is harvesting um, if you remember, I told you, um, when I plant leaf lettuce, I cut it once and then, um, the second time around is when I pull it out. If you cut a plant above its grow line, lettuce, spinach, those kinds of things grow from the middle, you'll actually see right in the middle what the grow line of that lettuce is, the new little leaf. If you cut your lettuce above that, your lettuce will continue to grow. So that's just showing you to harvest above the grow line. Um, watering, I've already said. I've already said keep the soil moist at one to two inches. Water consistently. You're going to have to weed hoe and fertilize as needed, either with compost or something else, and remove bugs and watch for disease. All part of tending. So as you can see, everything I'm talking about takes some time, some time, harvest. So now you've tended your garden, finally you get to eat something. Hopefully, if the bugs haven't eaten at all. Harvest when the fruit leaves or roots are ready. Um, again, you, you know about what time it takes to maturity. You can harvest your, your um, vegetables out of your garden when you, they're firm, but uh, not, not hard and not too soft uh, the old fingers will tell you or the color will tell you unless you're growing a green zebra tomatoes turn red <laughs> right or there's a few others too but um cherokee purple and others but uh, harvest it when it's ready to eat um, add some kind of nutrients after harvesting if you're going to plant in that same spot again or um, just to replenish the nutrients in the soil that's been used by that plant as it grew that fruit that you're about to eat. And you can replant with the same crop or rotate a different crop in there. I've already talked a little bit, a little bit about the succession planting and crop rotation.
You can also harvest seeds, but seeds and save them for next year if they're organic, if or if they're heirloom. Hybrids, uh, you're you're not don't use hybrids because you don't know first of all whether or not they're going to regrow, and secondly, you don't know which plant they're a hybrid of that they their characteristics might take on the next year. So you might think, man, this is the best looking fruit I ever had. And if it's a hybrid and you save the seeds and grow it next year, it could take the characteristics of the other plant and be a completely different uh, quality of uh, fruit that you're eating. But organic um, um, heirloom products are fine. You should always harvest from your best tasting, healthiest, most productive plants. If you've gardened, or even if you haven't and you're going to, you're going to find a plant that just seems to outproduce them all. Looks the best, is the healthiest, has the best fruit. Well, once that fruit is ripe and a little bit overripe and it's time to uh, harvest the seeds, pick a, pick a tomato from that plant. Pick a cucumber from that plant. Let your basil go to seed and pick the seed off the top of the flower. When the flower goes to seed at the top of the basil, use that basil plant. But pick from your tastiest, healthiest, most productive plants. A harvest when the seeds are ripe, which is slightly different than when the fruit, fruit is ripe. Be patient, clean them and dry them, store them in a cool, dry place out of the direct sunshine and label them not only with the fact that it's tomato, but what variety it is. Um, you'd be surprised how seeds begin to look a lot alike. And if you haven't labeled them and you think you're planting the sweet peppers and you've got uh, two boxes, 32 sweet peppers planted, and it turns out to be hot peppers, which isn't a bad thing, but they're not sweet peppers. So label, label, label is extremely important. So those are some general basic concepts and tips that I can give you around gardening. I, there's no way I can cover an hour and a half everything you need to know about gardening. I say, get out there, do it. Use the seed packet as your guide. Try it. Uh, keep your eyes open. Sun, water, good seed, soil. Um, you'll be successful to some degree, and whatever degree you're successful to, if you take time to observe, make notes, journal, um, then you'll get better. And if you decide it's just not what I want to do, I want to go to Kroger, go to Kroger. But this is a way extreme. Think about this. A tomato, I don't even know how many seeds a tomato have in, has in it. But I can tell you I've taken one tomato, saved the seeds, and next year I've maybe at my plant sale sold 50 tomatoes and had 50 for my garden out of that one tomato one tomato oh uh, so let's say that's 100 plants at anywhere from 12 to 20 pounds of plant that's 2,000 pounds of tomato out of that one tomato seed what do you think it would cost you to go buy 2,000 pounds of tomato now the soil costs something, the work is uh, time, is your time, which is worth something. It, it's not free, but it's sure a lot less expensive than what you would go pay for it in the store. And I guarantee you it will taste better because you pick it when it's ready, not before it's ready and ripen it in transit 3,000 miles to where it's going to, and it will store better for you. So if you have any questions, let me know. If you don't have any questions, that's okay. And I'll just do this slide in one more time. Uh, you can go here and find some other questions. Does anybody have any questions? They can put them in the chat and I can relay them to Alfred. By the way, you can always send me a message. I always respond within one to two days, and if I don't know the answer, I'll make it up and you'll never know the difference. <laughs> Actually, I'll look it up if I have to and find the answer for you or ask people who, who might know. So, 
we're always happy to help people grow their own food. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Does anyone have any questions? It's, okay, I've got one here from Janelle. Uh, which plants prefer to grow next to others? I guess some more examples of compatible. Companion planting. Yeah, companion um, plants. Like I said, nasturtium cucumbers, carrots, tomatoes, um, basil tomatoes grow well together. Um, dill, dill and cucumbers grow well together. Uh, sweet potatoes and cilantro. The cilantro likes to bolt in the summer. I let my pepper plants get a little bit uh, large. I put 16 in a box if it's a three by six box. In between the peppers, I will plant cilantro seeds. And it lasts a lot longer and doesn't bolt. So I have cilantro all summer long. Most people don't because it bolts on it. Um, let's see. Uh, there's other things. Um, you can find them online. Carrots Loves Tomato is a wonderful book. It'll tell you in detail what you can plant together, what you can't plant together. Um, but those are just a few examples of uh, different things that you can plant together. Yeah, I always find that um, um, one other thing, like when you're looking for companion plants, is to make sure that you're planting plants that require very similar sun requirements. So if you've got a shade plant, plant it with another shade plant, if it's a sun plant, plant with another sun plant, um, or water requirements. If something likes more water than others, make sure you plant those guys right next to each other. So, you know, you're not drowning one versus starving one of water. Or use the same, or use this uh, an abundance of the same nutrient coming out of the soil. Right. Because again, uh, if you plant uh, um, things that are use a lot of nitrogen or calcium or magnesium or sulfur together, they're going right. to deplete that soil quicker. So it's best to companion plant, like I said, beans with corn. Beans put it back, put nitrogen back into the soil that the corn takes out. Right. Yeah, and a lot of their vegetables that produce a fruit require more nitrogen and then vegetables that make more body parts like lettuces that you eat off of, those require more phosphorus instead. So you want to give, you know, maybe separate those more so for the different nutrient requirements. Okay, anyone else got any more questions? Thank you for the companion plant ideas. Oh, one other thing I'll say before I go. Mm -hmm. Gardening is an extremely useful tool at keeping children occupied. <laughs> And the sooner you get children involved in gardening, the more likely it is, even if they don't do it their whole life, that they will come back to us. So I can't save the world, nor do I want to, but our children need to learn how to grow their own food and how to be more self-sufficient. Even if it's a container of tomatoes, extremely important to involve the youth in gardening. Yeah, I've always, when I was young, found it satisfying to always grow my own food and say, oh, I, I grew this and now I get to eat it. And it's also a great, fantastic way to get kids outside in general. Outside, outside yeah. You know, if they're outside weeding or watering or just observing, you know, their plants or even just little insects and stuff around their plants, you know, it's, it's a great way to just get them outside. Does anyone have any more questions? For Alfred or for me, it's fine. Okay. Well, I just want to remind everyone um, 
Thank you for participating today. And we will have another Learn at Lunch session October 14th from the 12th to 1. And um, we will have um, Debbie Graham here with us to talk about JEEC recovery. And we'll also have Alfred back again to talk about hugs and give an overview of the whole program and maybe get some more bonding tips. So I want to thank you, Alfred. I have another one. Being with us. I have another yeah. one. Yeah. For you all better October email me. I'm, you better okay. email me on that one. I don't know about that one. But I'll put something okay. together. No big deal. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All cool. right. So um thank so you everybody. Yeah, thank you. I'll stop recording.